Well, Alan, let's start um, by talking about the final chapter of the story. What for you are the central themes in The Deathly Hallows Part 2, um, which, as we know, is finding its resolution and its termination of the, the whole Harry Potter saga? Um, well, uh, at the end of any great story, I suppose, like that, it's got to move towards a happy ending. <laughs> in one sense, uh, and growing up in, um, with Harry Potter, you know, you go from 12 years old to, well, a whole school career. I remember that, what it was like going to school at 11 and leaving at 18. I suppose you get some hindsight. And courage, perhaps, is courage key to this, this final part? Sure, for everybody, yes, mm -hmm. and, um, moral values and choices and um, right and wrong. How does the Deathly Hallows part two feel in comparison to the rest of the series? I mean, in what ways have the dilemmas and the, the dangers and, and the darkness perhaps increased? Um, I, it's a very gradual thing with, uh, with the books and the stories, uh, you know, and I, it, there's no other way of putting it. You're watching, if you, if you go to the centre of the story with those three kids, you're watching them become young adults. And so everything changes. You know, they, they're three little innocent faces, only three foot off the ground at the beginning. And, and then by the end, they're meeting the adults more or less at eye level and uh, romance has entered their lives. And as I just said, choosing big choices in life, uh, they're becoming adults. So it's incremental. It's not as if you can jump from one film, the one at the beginning to the film at the end and say, well, this is different from that in these ways. It's very much an incremental piece of masterful storytelling. I know we don't want to give away too much about Snape, but um, I find a, a rather interesting line, which is to burn with desire and keep quiet about it is the greatest punishment we can inflict on ourselves. And that's a line that might be familiar to you. It's from Lorca's Blood Wedding. It's not actually from Harry Potter, um, in which you, you appeared some years ago. Without giving away too much, how much light does that shine on, on Severus Snape, in a way? Um, well, he's very focused. Um, you know, he lives within a very, very tight confines, emotionally, physically. You know, when you, when we finally got to play a scene in what appeared to be his, his house, you know, I often wondered what that would look like. And I remember walking onto the set and saying to Stuart Craig, I don't know whether you'd have all these pictures on the walls. Um, the books I could understand, but in a sense Stuart was absolutely right, this was the house that his parents built and in a way all he does is goes there and you can't believe that he would go into that kitchen and cook any food, you, you wonder what he eats. Um, is there a takeaway somewhere at Hogwarts that he occasionally orders in from? Because you can't imagine that there's any other agenda in his life than the one he set himself. You haven't spoken much about his character over the years. You, sorry. you haven't spoken much about his character over the years. How important is it to you, or was it to you, to maintain an integrity about that as things rolled out and are revealed, if you like? Very important. Um, the, you know, the, the world we live in now is one where we where we we leapfrog ourselves all the time and. Uh, we have to give interviews about things uh, before people have seen them and so a lot of innocence is taken away from uh, not just children because of course grown-ups have been enjoying this series of books but of course I come into contact with a lot of hopeful little faces clutching whatever is their latest copy of the book being introduced or and, and we've all had this experience of being pointed out to children in the street or in or in some um, on a red carpet somewhere. And once they get over their confusion that I don't have a load of black hair, uh, 
then you can see a, a huge conversation going on with themselves and with this book that has opened up their imaginations. And I've just never wanted to get in the way of that because it's precious. Um, and as I say, a, a kind of innocence that you can't rip away from people. Um, Snape and Dumbledore share some intense scenes. Where do they rank amongst your favourite on-screen moments in the, in the series? When I walked onto the set to work with Richard Harris, um, that's iconic. And you think, I'm actually sitting in a makeup chair next to this guy and I've grown up watching him. Uh, and then moving on to Michael. Similarly, you know, when I was at drama school, an iconic figure to young actors. So uh, there's that level to it, which is just that you're working with these people. Um, and then there's a human level too, which is you get to know them. And Michael, I knew a bit before anyway, but sitting in a makeup chair with Richard Harris and, uh, and he's talking about Beckett and Shakespeare and Pirandello. And, uh, and then you go onto the set, Michael Gambon, you're only, always only this far away from him making you laugh. So, you know, you're, you're proud if you've got a take where it, he hasn't cracked you up. Well, Snape has wanted to say, <clears throat> turn to page 394 to have me quaking in my boots, never mind the children at Hogwarts. Um, to what degree is the voice key to this forbidding character? Well, if you're playing somebody, you don't judge them. So I don't know about things like forbidding or scary or uh, mysterious or any of that. You take the information you've got in the writing. And um, Jo Rowling's quite clear. She said he never raises his voice. <laughs> well, that's helpful. OK, I'll do that then. <laughs> Well, Dan Emma and Rupert did admit a while back to being a little bit scared of you in real life as well. And yet, anything that I've seen from the film, from the outtakes, you know, you're you're laughing. You're very in very good good form. But did you keep a bit of a stern countenance for them for the sake of their dramatic art? I think that, no, there was nothing ever deliberate. But you know, the nature of filming is that there's little or no rehearsal. You're straight into it. <clears throat> that means, and you're starting with three 12-year-olds. And I walk onto the set with black uh, lenses in my eyes and all black outfit and a black wig. And uh, one thing I can say for sure is that as soon as I put that costume on, something happens. You can't, you can't be someone else inside that outline. It has an effect on me. Uh, and and also you don't have time because you're looking for real concentration and you're trying to be as helpful to these three young people as possible. So it's better that I'm focused and not mucking about. Um, so I'm not surprised if they got a bit alarmed, but um, it was it was just the nature of the beast. Well, on your own background, you've a background in art and fine art, attending the Royal College of Art. How important is the, are the aesthetics of a, a project like Harry Potter to you? The look, the design, the feel of it, does, does that all hugely um, support the character and the work that you do? Absolutely crucial, and I suppose it's, the, in a way, the one shame of the advance of CGI. You know, we started this whole thing going off to locations in Oxford and Gloucester and uh, various Gothic corridors. And by the end, or 10 years later, the, the technique is so sophisticated that you end the film on a pile of old grass with a football stadium of lights around, knowing that they're going to fill in the background. So your imagination really has to work hard by the end of it. But, um, but the interiors, we're completely blessed by having an uh, absolute genius in Stuart Craig. And there's still a child in me that goes up to a pillar that I'm this far away from it and I know it's made of polystyrene but I have to tap it because it's so real. Um, oh no, it's, it's crucial because your imagination is fed. <laughs>